All right, Steve, we are uh, live on Facebook, and uh, I'd like to welcome all of our realtors that are uh, tuning in this morning. Uh, we are very fortunate and honored to have a special guest with me uh, today, uh, Steve Murray from Real Trends. Uh, many of you know Steve, and um, I'm, I'm not going to uh, read the uh, introduction that uh, would take uh, uh, all of our time this morning, all his acc accolades and accomplishments. Um, I will I will tell Steve real quick. You know, Steve, I've been doing these daily Facebook updates, and um, and they've really taken off. I, 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 it surprised me. We've uh, since uh, we kind of went into this COVID crisis. I've done about fifty five or fifty six of these daily updates, and um, and surprisingly to me, we've we've had. Uh, more than 26,000 views and lots of engagement and interaction and um, I, we are so excited to have you with us today and I believe you're in Colorado this morning right? I am. Well, yeah, I've been here for 11 weeks now which is the longest I haven't traveled somewhere in 40 years. Oh wow. <laughs> well I'm gonna turn it over to you Steve. Okay. Uh, I know you've got some insights to share with us today. Yep. Thank you for joining us. Nick, it's a real honor to be here. It always is. And I love a lot of friends and, and, and clients uh, in South Carolina. And as I was telling uh, Nick just a bit ago, I actually have one of my older sisters is a member of the South Carolina Realtors as a nice practice up in Tiga K, just south of Charlotte. So it's, it's really, really fun to be with all of you today. I, I want to be brief. I want to, I want to break uh, what I want to share into three sections. The first is, in a manner of speaking, I call it some factual myth-busting <clears throat> that I want to share with everyone tuned in. And two, what are the two most important tactics that leading professionals, whether they're brokers or agents, can do right now uh, to not only survive the downturn we've been through and are already coming out of, but actually build a better practice, whether you're a brokerage company or you're an agent. And some, some men and women who are on this call may have heard me say this in other forums over the last 10 weeks. Just because you may have heard it or you may have heard someone else say some of these things doesn't mean they're not true or not worthwhile. The third section is talk about what the recovery looks like, although that for South Carolina, because of great leadership in your state, it, that might be a redundant conversation. So let's get started. What, one of the things in the foundations of our industry, we must look to the relationship of housing consumers to real estate agents and, and agents to brokers. These relationships all matter. Whether we're doing research on housing consumers or we do a lot of research on agents and what they value about a brokerage company i'll share a little bit of both and bust some myths let's first talk about housing consumers you know the myths over the last 20 years is that the tech industry and tech offerings are going to disintermediate the relationship between agents and customers or brokers and agents right well Nothing could be further from the truth. Here's some facts. On the consumer side, every four or five years, we hire Harris Insights, large research organization, very respected, to do research on recent buyers and sellers. The usage of agents by housing consumers, when we did this in the summer of 2018, was at a 20-year high. Myth number two, for instance, was, oh, millennials and Gen X won't use agents. They'll use smartphones and the Internet. Well, the usage among young buyers and sellers was 92%, actually. And how consumers found their agent and selected one, well, that hasn't changed for 30 years. Two-thirds of them said, I know an agent or someone I know referred me. So some myths on that side. Let me share some myths about agent and broker relationships. We did a major study, a national study, less than a year and a half ago with a group of 400 leading teams. And we asked them a bunch of questions about their business, but we asked them 
for instance, what is it that a broker does that is highly valuable? And number one was legal and regulatory assistance. But number two was a good local or national brand name that only a good brokerage can bring to them. When we did a study a few years before that, we looked at the top 15 brokerages in the whole country out of a thousand on performance metrics. And then we in interviewed 169 of agents and teams of those 15 brokers about why they joined a particular brokerage and why they stayed there. Well, let me assure you, it was terms like the vision of the leadership, the discipline of the leadership, the communication skills of the leadership. It was building a sense of community. It was giving back to the community. Nothing you heard me say says tech marketing facilities. Nothing. In fact, I had to prod it out of those 169 hour long interviews I did. Well, what about marketing and technology? Well, yeah, but most brokers have pretty good marketing technology. Everything agents value about being with a brokerage company is based primarily on a relationship, on governance, on accountability, on discipline and communications. Last I checked, not one of those attributes of either a great agent or a great brokerage company has to do with technology. In fact, when we talk, go back to housing consumers and we ask housing consumers, we said, what is it, what services do agents provide that are the most important to a consumer? Every time we've done this survey for 20 years, negotiating the price and terms of a purchase or sale has been number one every time we've done this going back 20 years. Number three, by the way, was navigating the process of buying or selling a home. And when we ask consumers, what is it that is more, most important when you're working with an agent? Every single time we've done it, far and away the number one, I want an agent I can trust. So what we notice from all of our research, some of it with outside professional firms, some that we've done ourselves, everything in our industry primarily, <clears throat> pardon me, is still based on a relationship and on personal skills and attributes and trust. Whether that relationship is between customers and agents or agents and their brokerage company. We know anecdotally from a lot of our research that over all the years and having a front row seat for 40 years of the residential brokerage industry, we know that it is the power of relationships that create great agent practices and great brokerage companies. Now, I am not saying, and don't quote me as saying, oh, we don't need technology at all. Frankly, uh, last year I used a great agent, and the first time I did three transactions last year, I sold a home and downsized and bought a new home and sold an investment property I'd owned for 15 years or so. I hadn't done an actual transaction in quite a long time. I think the slickest technology I've ever seen was online forms and digital signatures. I mean, that is, if you're not using that, you need to start using that. That is a really great technology. And I'm not saying good websites aren't important and CRM, some of the really great tools out there, CRM tools, aren't useful and good. But you know, great agents know if you didn't have a CRM, except for maybe in your head or on a spreadsheet, you could still be a great agent. Technology does not yet drive success in our industry. It is relationships and trust and performance and understanding what matters most to your customers, whether those buyers are sellers or if you're a brokerage, your primary customers are agents and teams. So all the research that we've seen from both done by outside professionals ourselves, that, that's the things you can trust. 
It means that agents and brokers are still a vital part of delivering service to people who want to own their dream. Oh, one last thing. Remember those myths we've been hearing for 15 years? Young families don't want to, don't want to own a home like their parents did. Well, go check out, yes, NAR, mortgage bankers, home builders, but go to the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard, which is no shill for our industry, or the Pew Research Organization, PEW. Go look at their reports on attitude towards home ownership. Young families, young men and women, they want to own a home every bit as much as we did and our parents. Owning one's own home. And now with the impact of COVID, we're going to see a lot of people making different choices about where they live. If they now may be working out of their homes, well, maybe the house they have isn't really conducive to actually working out of their home. Who knows? <clears throat> it's a bright future. So let's shift now. What are the two things that you should focus on doing? It doesn't matter whether you're a brokerage company or an agent or a team, just two things. And I know we're by the worst of what could happen. At least we sure pray that we're by it and hope that we are. It looks like we are, but let, let's just do this. These two things are what good business people do when times are a little uneasy or unsettled or uncertain and actually the two things you should always do with your business. Number one, if you have considered that you have been close to your people, get closer, get closer. I have said this to, my gosh, shared this with hundreds of brokerage companies and thousands of agents in the last 10 weeks. And I always get a bunch of chat chuckles and all kinds of stuff, but I really do mean that, you know, text is great, email's great, social media is great, but how about old fashioned technology called a phone? And if you're a brokerage company, have you really gotten close to understand what your agents are doing and what they're suffering and the doubts they have and the leadership they're looking for? It's never too late. If you haven't already started doing this using, you know, telephone, using Zoom, using webinars, they're all good all good tools but there's best of all is pick up the phone and call someone just to ask them how they're doing if you're an agent start with your family then your friends and then your past clients and customers and current client customers trust me you'll be amazed how many of those people have not had someone call them just to ask how they're doing just to ask how they're doing so if you're close or consider you're close, find out ways to get closer to those people you consider your clients or customers. And by the way, family and friends also need that attention. We all do in times like these. I will tell you one last thing. 10 weeks ago, I did this myself and called between, I forget the exact number, 50 to 75. Pat, I already called all family and friends but I called 50 to 75 past clients and customers, most of whom are not even in the business anymore. I had sold their brokerage companies for them some time ago. All I will tell you is I got more out of it than I gave by calling them in the first place. And I just called to ask them how they were doing. And many of them were grateful for the fact that someone had taken the time to call and ask just that. How are you? How's your family? I talked to the, this morning, talked to the head uh, of one of the largest brokerage companies in the United States. I haven't talked to him in probably two months. I called him up and yes, we had business to talk about, but the first thing we talked about was I asked him, how are you and how's your father and your mother and your, your sisters and your brother and your family. And we talked for 10 minutes about our families. There's nothing more important right now than to get closer to not only the people you care about, family and friends, but this is a great time to reach out to your clients and customers, whomever they may be. Number two, it is a time <clears throat> to preserve cash, <clears throat> preserve capital. There is no better time than right now, if you haven't already done it, 
to look at your checkbook, your QuickBooks, your Quicken, your general ledger, whatever accounting system you have, and look back at the last six to 12 months of your business spending and, and make a hard, hard choice. What things are really not necessary? What, what, I mean, what is not really necessary? And stop spending it. Clean it up. I mean, here we have a little company, Real Trends. We're just several millions in revenues and nine employees. We did it last summer, you know, not knowing this coming, just did it because it was important. We found about thirty-five to forty thousand dollars of stuff that we didn't know why we were spending that stuff. So we did it just two months ago again. And to give you an example, the, the craziest thing we found was we were paying for two water coolers. Didn't even know it. It's only $35 a month, but you know what? That's $400 a year almost. Why, why waste it? It's a great time to review your spending and your investment and what you're doing and preserve capital. Now I will tell you, this is the fifth recession I have lived through in this industry, having been in the industry 44 years now. I lived through the 80 to 82 recession, the one at the end of the 80s, the one at the beginning of the 2000s, and then the 2006, 2009, and now here we are again. I had actually not planned to be here for another recession, but here I am, and I'm having more fun than ever working with all the people like my friends who may be on this, uh, this presentation today. And I will tell you, I had a front row seat for each one of them. The first one, I was running a national broker-to-broker -broker referral network of major independent firms, some of whom may be on this, uh, this presentation today. So I've been watching how the best brokers and top teams and agents deal with downturns for a long time. Those two things are the things they tend to do. In times like these, focus on a few basic things that will create success. And here's the point. If you develop those habits to do that, don't stop. When times get good again, which I hear they already have, in most of South Carolina, don't stop doing those things because that is how you build a great business, whether you're an agent, a team, or a brokerage company. And I have seen circumstances throughout my career when people failed to do one or the other and they didn't make it through the recession. In fact, in the 1988 to 1992 roughly downturn, I watched five <clears throat> of the top 20 brokerages in the country went under in that time. They had to sell out for pennies because particularly since they didn't do number two, but they also didn't do number one much either. Okay, so lastly, the recovery. Well, you know, so I've been tracking through the showing time index what's going on and what's going on around the United States of America is if, where agents were, were allowed to work. We did not see a huge drop off where they were allowed to work for about a month. Sales were down 20, 30, 35% from mid-March or so to mid-April. But boy, starting in April, particularly in those states where agents were allowed to show again, almost every state in the country now showings are at above or above where they were last year at this time. So we have seen this spring surge, and that's great. Number two, and South Carolina will be the beneficiary of this, You're, we're seeing evidence all over the country of families moving out of major urban core areas and wanting to move to the country or move to the shore and to get away from major heavy populated areas. And yes, I'm, yes, we can talk about New York and Washington and Chicago and happening on the West Coast too. But I mean, a lot of movement, for instance, just taking place out of New York City out to Connecticut and New Jersey. You may have some people that are gonna move out of Charlotte and wanna move down to Piedmont, down to South Carolina. Maybe they go to Greenville, Spartanburg, maybe they go to Charleston. There's a lot of beautiful country in South Carolina, without doubt. 
So good recovery, but here's two things to keep in mind. We have between 35, <clears throat> 35 and 40 million unemployed fellow Americans. Those people, while they're unemployed, are not going to qualify to buy a home. And we saw a good jobs report this morning, and it looks like that, that's starting to turn around. But it's not going to turn around in two, three months. And while many people think, well, these were, you know, retail workers and restaurant workers, and, you know, and that's true, and flight attendants, and people worked at hotels, and that's all true. But millions and millions of white collar managerial employees have also been let go. Particularly in the tourism industry, which is, I'm sure, a big part of South Carolina's economy. We're not going to get through that. So every economist I've read believes that when things settle down after this surge, we probably end the year with some variation from state to state off 12 to 20 percent in housing unit sales this year. One other factor feeding into that. And I can't prove it. I wish I had the, uh, the data to share with you. But just observation through four prior recessions, that top 5 to 10% of sellers and buyers, the luxury end, that tends to get soft for 12 to 18 months after a recession. Now, I've confirmed that only by talking to top brokers in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, and Denver. All of them have reported that, in fact, that's what's going on in their markets. In Denver, for example, under 900,000, we have a month and a half supply of homes. We're, cut, like, we're, we're back to where we were three months ago. But above a million, they're now up to 10 and a half months supply of homes, which is double where it was three months ago. So you got that high upper end will get quieter, and you've got some first time home buyers and move up home buyers affected by unemployment, we probably won't recover all the way this year. Probably won't. But probably will by sometime in 2021. Probably. But you know what? Every brokerage on this call or agent or team who might be listening in, if you can't make a profit at 80 or 85% of where you were, say, six months ago, you need to get to work. We all can operate at 80 or 85 percent of where we were and still make a profit. I didn't say it was easy. I just said it's doable because I've seen agents, teams, and brokers do it throughout my career. One last thing I want to say, and I hope somebody else has told you all this, but for years I have also had a front row seat to brokers, agents, and teams complaining about their realtor dues. What am I paying all this money for? What does this get me? Nick did not know I was going to say this, by the way. But I've repeated this in numerous other occasions in the last 10 weeks. Well, here's the deal. At the local, state, and national level, if you did not have great leadership working with local and state governments and NAR working in Washington, DC, you may have had your business shut down like happened in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and New York, and you would have really gotten hurt. In most every state in the country, including yours, the State uh, Association of Realtors, Nick and his team, I'll guarantee you, they were immediately working with the governor and the governor's staff and the regulators to be sure you could keep working. And at the local level, because a lot of cases, like what happened up in Charlotte, the state said, yeah, whatever. And the mayor of Charlotte shut agents down for what? Five weeks, six weeks, they couldn't work in Charlotte? Well, your realtor associate, that's what your dues pay for is for this kind of circumstance, along with all the other things they do. And for those agents who may have gotten to apply for unemployment, that was NAR. They went to Washington, D.C. to make sure independent contractors were included in the unemployment benefit program. They actually had a special program for those kind of people. So Nick did not know I was going to say that, but I think it's important everybody 
understand that we do have regulatory authorities and political organizations that can make or break our ability to do business. And that those men and women who are funded and in place because of your dues make a lot of difference when it counts in terms of your being able to practice your profession. And if you have a moment, you might drop Nick and, his, and your local leaders and Nick and his team and NAR, drop them a note because believe me, it could have gone the other way. It could have. So anyway, with that, I've taken a lot of your time this morning. I hope any part of this was useful to those who are listening in. Uh, it's an honor to be in this profession at this time. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you. Steve, I will take questions if people have any. Steve, thank you. Um, while I go through the questions real quick, why don't, you know, there may be, I know this is probably not, uh, 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 probably not accurate, but there may be a few people that don't know what Real Trends is. Why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about your company? And, I, and let me look through the questions real quick and see what uh, okay. pops up. So Real Trends is, we're in our 34th year. There's really two things we do. We are a research and publishing trends company. So we publish, you can go to realtrends.com. We have daily blogs. We have podcasts about a wide range of trends and strategies and inter industry interviews. We also host CEO conferences of all kinds. I have four or five brokerage uh, CEO group forum groups and three realtor CEO leadership forum groups. And we have a big conference each year called the Gathering of Eagles. If you're a broker owner, we'd love to have you. It'll be November 9th through the 11th here in Denver. The other side is consulting. We consult with brokerage companies and teams primarily on valuations, mergers, acquisitions, general consulting, and guidance. Great. And that's kind of in a nutshell what Real Trends does. We have nine full-time people here. And you started in this business when you were what, three or four years old? Yeah, I'd like to think <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, it was 1970. We just started our 44th year, 1977, and um, I was 20, what was I? I was 23 years old. Wow. Um, so it's, it's all, I've, it mostly all I've ever known as in my working life. That's great. Um, the comments, Steve, are, are extremely positive, thankful for uh, your information you shared today. I don't see any questions. You know, okay. one, one of the things that uh, you mentioned I believe, you know, we've said for a long time, I, at least I've always felt, one of the biggest potential threats to our industry is not from these uh, forces of change through technology and other things, but regulatory and legislative uh, attacks on our industry. And, yeah. and, and what we've seen over the last eight weeks is how government can shut us down completely. Right. And, and we've been very fortunate in South Carolina uh, our partnerships with our local and national associations, uh, years of relationship building through RPAC, and it all came together in a way to protect our members' business uh, going forward. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, you know, watching the Showing Time Index, it was, it was very interesting to watch Michigan and Pennsylvania where they were the longest shut down. So like their showings, we're down 98%. So there are essentially no showings. And, and this is factual. On, on uh, Monday, I think it was May 4th, Michigan allowed agents to show homes again. So that was on a Monday. By Friday of that week, they were equal to the showing level of last year. Wow. So, so you had this pent up demand from consumers that wanted to go out and buy a home or look at homes and sell their homes because it, 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 people, uh, they're, they're consumers, that's what, that's what they want to do. And these governors, in Pennsylvania, by the way, the same thing happened, although they just got opened up, uh, gosh, I think it was only two weeks ago. You're right. It was and so the same weird. thing happened. Their showings just went like up yeah. like a rocket. Uh, but they've wrecked they've wrecked a whole year 
for a couple of brokerage company clients of mine and agents. I mean, they basically got put out of business for two months. Oh, I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm really yeah. proud. I'm really proud of our members here in South Carolina as they've continued to, you know, pra practice. You know, we, our motto has been we're open for business, but it's not business as usual. And, you know, following CDC guidelines, social distancing, yep. wearing protective gear and uh, protecting themselves, their clients is still a very critical, you know, critical time. Um, and, uh, and it's important to, to emphasize, I think, uh, the safety yeah. aspect. No, I can't. I mean, I've, I've had to say that a few times because I got some people going, yeah, 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 the protocols. And I said, you know what? If you can't operate safely with the protocols, then go find something else to do. This, this is not, look, we, it, maybe in our private time, we can snicker a little bit about some of the, the, the procedures people are asking us to do. But you know what? It's not that much of a hardship to practice showing homes and getting deals done and getting inspections done and doing it safely. It, it's not that much to ask. No, I, I agree, Steve. You yeah, know, we, we, we started the year on a, on a fantastic note. Uh, you know, 2019 was a record year in South Carolina. 2020 was looking to be even better. Um, we got hit with this crisis of health. And, you know, now we've been, now we're facing a crisis of, of heart. Uh, and yeah. uh, I'd love uh, at another time to, to delve into that with you a little bit and and to talk about how we can improve diversity within our, our firms and within our associations and, and how we interact with our clients and customers. Um, yeah. But it's uh, uh, 2020, I have found to be a year of uh, personal growth for me uh, as we've challenged ourselves in uh, finding new ways to engage our members and, and I've really relied on you know, I follow your podcasts, which are fantastic, and the uh, interviews that you do with industry leaders uh, is such valuable information. Thank you for, for sharing that, and thank you for sharing your insights with us today. I really appreciate it. Well, Nick, it's, it's, it's just an honor to do it, and, and uh, you and I have worked together a few times. It's always I've always benefited from that more than I gave, and hopefully today somebody got an inkling of an idea or information they can share with, with other of their peers and we'll try to help everybody have a better year than they thought. Awesome. Well, Steve, yep. th thank you thank again. You. Have a yep. great day. And to everyone, uh, all our realtor friends, um, this is Nick checking in with you on Friday, uh, June the 5th. And I uh, hope you have a great weekend. I'll be back in touch with you on Monday. Thank Bye you. all.